Well, we will go ahead and kick it off this evening. Um, I just want to say a big thank you for everyone joining us tonight. I would like to quickly introduce your Wallace Pearson travel team for a couple of people that might not have met us face to face yet. Um, we have Angie Wallace with us, one of the founders of Wallace Pearson Travel, if you'll do a little wave, thank you. I'm Angela Pearson, and um, we also have with us Lynn-Ann Mullis and Tracy Lynch and Debbie Kellogg. We are all here to make the world of travel a fun and beautiful place for you and add as many surprise and delights along the way as possible. Um, tonight, I'm very excited to introduce the infamous Lisa Bain with Limbad Expeditions. Any of you that have joined us at a travel show at the Ritz-Carlton or some of our previous Limblad events, you will definitely recognize this beautiful Aussie that we love. She's here to share all things Limblad with us and she will introduce the fabulous Ralphie Hopkins, who many of you already have heard of or met in person. Thanks again for joining us. And with that, Lisa, I will turn the screen over to you. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can see some of these great images. And then um, I'm going to chat for just a little while. And then the wonderful Ralph Lee Hopkins is going to join and he's going to take the reins. So um, as, as Angela said, you know, I've been to many events there on Amelia Island. It's hard doing this via Zoom and not being there in person to, to see you all. But I do want to just spend a couple of moments and just revisit some of our history because that's really important to who Limblad Expeditions is. Um, you know, we started way back in 1966 when we took that first little red ship to Antarctica. A lot has changed since 1966. But I think this is one thing that hasn't changed. And that is what um, this is what that is what Lars um, Limblad really stood for and what he believed in. And that was that educated people who see things with their own eyes could be a potent force for the preservation of the places that they visit. And that was the whole reason he wanted to get out and explore and share the world with other people. And when he took those first guests to Antarctica, that was the whole reason to get them down there so they could understand that these places without a voice may not be there for the next generation. And so Lars Eric um, was the first in Antarctica, he was then the first in Galapagos the following year. He actually paid the wages of the first two park rangers to ensure that those islands were protected for the generations to come. But his son Sven Limblad has now been at the helm of the company for over 40 years. And Sven has done a lot. He's introduced multiple new ships, destinations, new types of equipment for us to see deeper and further. He's also built this amazing expeditionary team of ornithologists, botanists, historians, ethnomusicologists, specialists in the regions that we visit. But I think the most important thing for all of you who've been aboard a Limblad expedition or have met any of our expedition team is their ability to share and be engaged. Just they're so excited about these places and so approachable. And I think that's even more important than any other skill, approachability, right? The ability for someone to come with any question and feel like no question is a silly question. That's what's really important. Now, one of the other really cool things that Sven has done is our alliances. And there are quite a few, but the one most people know us for is our alliance with the National Geographic Society. And that alliance you will see on our ships because they're called the Lindblad National Geographic and then the name of the ship. And we have that co-branding on our vessels. It means we have access to amazing data and knowledge it means that we work with the National Geographic Society with our Limblad National Geographic uh, Fund, which helps to put money back into the places we explore and visit. And that's really important because we believe that you shouldn't go somewhere unless you're making it better than when you arrived. Um, it's extremely important to us on all levels. You know, we're a carbon neutral company. We have no single use plastics on our ships and we continue to work to be even more sustainable in all of our endeavors. As most of you know, expedition travel is about getting out there. The ship is basically our tool to get us where we want to go. We don't cruise. That's a dirty word. We explore. And when you get there, we want you off that ship as much as possible in the Zodiacs, getting onto those remote beaches, in kayaks, on paddle boards, snorkeling, perhaps diving in some of the places we go, but making real use of all of that great breadth of cool tools that we have at Limblad. Then we have all of these other elements that help to see deeper, like hydrophones to hear whale song, video microscopes. So you can look at the plankton in the water around the ship and really understand that marine biodiversity. 
We even have a videographer on all of our ships, a Limblad Nat Geo fleet, that is filming every aspect of each departure. And at the end, there's this brilliant video of that week or that however long you've been on the ship, the experiences, those shared experiences of your community of fellow travellers. And one of the really cool things we have is our underwater dive team. And these guys are diving in cold climates or warm climates, but to be able to be under the ships in Antarctica or Alaska or in these colder areas and share that really vibrant marine biodiversity, bring it back up in video content for all of our guests is really amazing. The other really cool things, and I know Angela and Angie have, um, are, are really appreciative of this is our Global Explorers Program. This is brilliant for those multi-generational families. Um, this was designed with National Geographic Education for our under 18 year old guests. This is on all Galapagos, Alaska, Baja and really exciting news. It's about to be launched on our Antarctica itineraries as well. So that's coming soon. So keep an ear out for that. But it just means our young guests really get the chance to understand and learn the skills of an explorer. Of course, sustainability, I talked about that. This is about green business practices, preserving the cultures in the places we go, protecting the natural resources and supporting local communities. We buy local. We buy from all of our local producers of wines, beverages, foods, so that you have that sustainability aboard the ship and the flavours that come through from all of those local growers and purveyors. And we all do this on small ships, right? Our biggest ship is 148 guests, 148 guests, right? Now, smallest is 28 on the Amazon. So this is all about intimate, up-close exploration. But one of the real key differentiators for us are the amazing men and women that join us on our ships, Brown in Blood. National Geographic Photography Program. And I'm really excited tonight to have Ralph Lee Hopkins with us. Um, he has traveled to some of the world's most wild places with Limblad Expeditions. We're all, I'm always very envious when I hear his stories because he's just been to so many remarkable places. He was the founding director of our Expedition Photography Program for National Geographic for the fleet. Um, and he's photographed expeditions from Antarctica to the Arctic and everything in between. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the man of the hour. I'm going to turn off my screen and let him share his wonderful stories. And then I'll be back at the end for another quick update. Am I virtual? Am I in Antarctica? That's where I would have been a year ago, I guess. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for, for attending. Thanks for taking time out of your busy streaming schedule or whatever it is you're doing during this, this great pause. Um, and it's an honor to be here. Um, I've had the pleasure to travel with some folks from Amelia Island. And I've heard about this tea raised place, but I haven't been there yet. Maybe uh, Uber Eats can, can bring me a burger. But um, I'd like to talk to you tonight um, about Limblad and our photo program. And I hope you're, you're ready to take a virtual, a virtual expedition. There we go, now I'm clicking. Um, but this, I, I've been working with Lindblad and the spin off Lindblad for 30, 32 years, uh, including the pause. And um, this, this experience last year with Emperor Penguins is, is right up there, but so many of my experiences are right up there. And my background, just real quick, and for those of you don't, who don't know me, is um, I didn't set out to be a photographer, I'm a geologist. And my dad worked for the space program. He may help make the, the LEM, the lunar module for, from an aerospace. So this image of the earth really, I mean, I know it affected a lot of people when they saw it, but it really affected me. And it made me want to explore, to live a life of exploration. I became a geologist and but geologist by nature, explore. And so I've been very lucky in my career that um, in 1989, I. I met someone that was working with, with, at that time, Special Expeditions when the company had one ship. And I took a trip to Baja, California as the geologist talking about the geology. And then um, my photography career took off because I was traveling to all these places back when it was film. And then I started teaching with National Geographic and lo and behold, Lindblad and National Geographic came together. And so my worlds of photographing for for Limblad Expeditions and publications came together with National Geographic when we formed our alliance. And so I've done many workshops with National Geographic and um, 
Of course, the, the fleet has grown and I'm still waiting for her to do the inaugural trip with the endurance and the resolutions coming online later this year. We're gonna hear about more about that from Lisa, but it's an amazing now our fleet is um, going worldwide and going all the time, except for this pause. Um, the beautiful thing about our ships and the reason I helped found the expedition photography program was that it's the perfect platform for, for photography and exploration and learning. And that's what we do because we've got Zodiacs, we've got kayaks, we've got undersea specialists, uh, we get out on shore and on many of our trips on all the, what we call the blue water ships that go pole to pole. We have National Geographic photographers that team with our onboard photo instructors that have been trained by National Geographic photographers. Um, on our smaller ships, there's always a, a photo instructor on board. And then we also have ex uh, photo expeditions where um, we kind of beef up the, the photographic crew on board, National Geographic photographers on board. And so if you wanna learn photography in the moment, I mean, this isn't the kind of workshop where you just close the, close the blinds and, and, and then, uh, and then learn that way. This is, we are out shooting and um, having a great time in the moment. And that's really what photography is about. And that's what we try to teach. That is that being in the moment and observing, and that's with naturalists, it really becomes a more meaningful experience when you know something about what you're photographing. Um, on board, we have the, the b &H Photo Locker. So you're able to try some of the new gear. This isn't a rental <laughs> shop. We, we can't keep that much gear. But our alliance with B&H, and I've bought all my equipment over the years. I wish I had 1% compounded for the last 35 years of what I spent at B&H. Um, so we've gone from film when we started the photo expeditions now, of course, into this digital world, um, which is just amazing. So you've got to have the right camera for the right situation, like a waterproof camera. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about equipment because some of the pre-seminar uh, or, or pre-talk questions were very specific about photography. You want some kind of camera you're going to use. Of course, the iPhone, everyone's got an iPhone, hopefully, or some kind of device that you can photograph with. But there's a lot of other gear that you can use. This is an, a housing uh, a, a, with a dome port for my iPhone. And so for going to Baja or Galapagos or any place or even Antarctica where you can get your camera wet, um, you also want to protect your gear. So there are you know, things that you just want to have, and that is a rain sleeve for your camera or some kind of protection for your, your phone. Boots, rain gear, yeah, you just have to have it. You want to be ready. Um, you don't need the tripod and the monopod. Uh, it depends on how far you're going to take it with your, your photography. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, how that can help you. But if you're if you want to be out, and some of the best images are made in the most inclement weather, but if you want to be out in Antarctica um, in the blowing snow and get some amazing images, you've got to have good gloves. So I recommend these flip mitt type glacier gloves. Um, you can get them online and there's many different, if I've now gone to ones that are made in Norway, they seem to make the best ones, but um, you can put hot hands in them so you can always be warm. There were some questions about what kind of gear I carry and I've gone to Olympus, which is now called OM Digital Solutions. And they have very small mirrorless cameras. They're lighter weight, um, great optics. And that's what I've gone to because it all fits into this beautiful bag. Um, so I've gone from carrying big um, mirror cameras, right, with the mirror to mirrorless. And I find I'm much more productive in my photography. Um, it all fits in this cube when I, when I travel to the destination. Uh, there's a lot of great waterproof backpacks out there now. So if you're going to one of these remote destinations, think about that because we can have wet landings. Don't forget your iPhone. iPhone is the great equalizer. Um, we have people who photograph the entire expedition. Of course, you can't really zoom in for wildlife. So there are some limitations, but for video, for um, making portraits, a shallow depth of field, doing slow motion, doing panoramics. Um, there's also something called live mode where if you hold the camera still, it will blur the action by making a short video. And of course, the, what everyone loves to do for selfies, but um, having your phone ready, having a waterproof, many of them now are, are waterproof. I like to have a lanyard on my phone so I don't drop it overboard. It always scares me <laughs> to see people holding it over water, but 
again, you know, for the kids and for the generations and for you know, basically everyone has something to, to make a picture with. So with that little introduction on equipment, let's uh, bear with me here. Let's take some virtual expeditions because I am like dying to go. You know, I, I'm, this is usually when I get back from Antarctica and, and I get prepare for, for Baja by going to Hawaii, but let's go south. Let's go south to Antarctica. And um, of course we have two soon to be three ships that'll be flying the waters down there to the white continent. And this is what everyone's so scared about the Drake Passage and crossing to get down there, but this is what it's like, perfectly glass. We call it the Drake's Lake. Now, of course, a percentage of the time the wind kicks up and that's good because then you can photograph the albatross and the other seabirds. That was a prion um, in, in the last photo, painted petrol. Um, this is probably a black browed albatross and then, oh, I forgot to take this picture out. It can, it can, I get seasick. Darwin got seasick. There's nothing wrong with take the medication. You could sleep. It's one, one day down there. Best, best thing to do is to be out on deck and, and photographing and watching the horizon. But you get down there and then you find the ice. And usually it's a bottle of champagne for the first person who spots the first, or for the person who spots the first ice bird. But it is magic when you get down to, now we're not, it's not like going to the Arctic where you're above the Arctic Circle. When you get down there, the sun will set, but it takes a long time to go down and you get some amazing sunsets. But it's about the ice. Your first, the first time you go to Antarctic, you go for the penguins. The next three times you go for the ice. And we spend a lot of time in the ice. We're looking for penguins. Uh, here's a bunch of gentoos on the ice with the Orion nosing up. And there are times where if we can, we'll park in the ice so that we can get out on the ice. It is a white world down there. And so we just nose the ship in. And if the ice is safe, we'll get out and cush country skis and snowshoes and walk around on the ice. Um, but Zodiacs are really our key to operations anywhere in the world. Um, leopard seals, this is the, the famous leopard seal that eats penguins and krill. Uh, this is a wet L seal. Um, that we find on the ice and penguins. We have kayaks where you can float and explore and not get too close to the ice, but look for the wildlife. Uh, these are some chin straps on the ice. But penguins, I mean, who doesn't love penguins? Uh, Gen twos and um, you know, in January and February, the chicks are getting bigger. Uh, it's hard to find a clean penguin. Um, this one happened to be uh, near the, actually the station at Port Lockroy. Um, and it got them on a good day. Uh, a little story about penguins playing on an iceberg. These penguins were using the ice as a, as like a jungle gym, like a diving board, and they were egging each other on. And I finally got keyed in and pre-focused on the ice and started to get them jumping and flying. And uh, this, this, this image has, has gotten around quite a bit. There's something about seeing a penguin flying. Um, it's, I've been accused of Photoshop on this image, but if I Photoshopped it, I would have had two wings. You can only see one flipper. Um, and this comes back to that experience with the emperors. And, and I show this because 30 years of going down to Antarctica, well, not 30 years going to Antarctica, 20 years going to Antarctica, of travel to see an emperor, to be with an emperor on the ice. And who knew that they come right over to you? They're curious, like most wild animals most birds and they come over and then they just start preening in front of you. Um, this isn't me in the photo because I'm taking the photo in this case, but this one ended up on one of our brochure covers. Um, I can't mention Antarctica without mentioning South Georgia. South Georgia, uh, so that's the longer itinerary where you go Falkland, South Georgia, Antarctica. And I don't know if we still do just the South Georgia Falkland itinerary or not, but uh, South Georgia is like the Serengeti uh, of the Arctic or sub-Antarctic. Um, with king penguins by the hundreds of thousands on these beaches. There's nothing like it. And again, they're curious. If you just sit down and kneel down, they will come up and check you out. So it's true, I've traveled pole to pole over my 30 something years. And um, so heading up to the Arctic, this would be in our summer in the Northern hemisphere. And when we talk Arctic, we're talking kind of Iceland, Greenland, Arctic Canada and Svalbard. Um, I'm not, <laughs> there are other places in the Arctic that we travel now, uh, but uh, like into the Russian Arctic, 
um, but that's not the subject of this talk. But again, it's about the ice. And the difference between Antarctica and, and the Arctic is the Arctic, the pole, the North Pole, is covered by an ocean. Of course, Antarctica covers the South Pole. So we can get much farther north uh, above 80 degrees sometimes, and the sun never sets in the summer when we're there. So we cruise the ice looking for wildlife to get to destinations. We get out in Zodiac. We did not go through this cave in the Zodiac. Um, we linger out on deck. This is, again, one of those, it's kind of like that Antarctic sunset. This sunset wouldn't stop uh, after dinner because the sun is so tangential to the horizon as it's going down, it takes hours. But this is what we're after up there. and, and in addition to walrus and narwhal and seeing whales, but the polar bear, the ice bear, if you've never seen one in the wild, uh, it is incredible and it's also humbling. Uh, again, it forces you to be in the moment when you see a, a creature, the way it walks across the ice and, and just such a famous animal in the world. And this image was taken years ago in Svalbard. Um, so in Norway, and this bear went back and forth walking through the water. And it's kind of become an emblem for, for climate change, this bear kind of reflecting on the melting ice. But it did jump at times between, between the, the flows. So myself and 148 of my friends on the Explorer, we made beautiful images. Um, this was kind of a Hail Mary shot using a, a monopod and on the timer. And I didn't realize that I got it standing up. Uh, it's fun. Again, bears, they're out there and they see something, they investigate everything. They're, they're, they're curious and they probably can smell the soup for lunch and they come over and check out the ship and we spend a little bit of time and then go on our way. But often they'll just relax and put on the show. They'll investigate the ship, wonder who we are, um, look up at you with an inquisitive look. So um, it doesn't happen every trip, but we see them very almost every trip in the Arctic because they are there and we spend a lot of time looking for them. And of all the images I've made of polar bears, I love this black and white. It's a black and white conversion um, using Photoshop. But the light, I mean, I, we talked a little bit about the light in Antarctica, the way it gets late, the late light and the Arctic is the same way with a window, a little sliver, up, you know, at, at sunset. And, but the, when it gets good, it lasts, that in the light like that might last for an hour. The Arctic. Shifting over to Alaska, moving right along, um, beautiful light, different mountain. Now that's that's Denali, aka Mount McKinley, and we do do extensions up there, but this is about being on the ship in Alaska, and typically, well, I'm going to talk about southeast Alaska, where the brown bears, the coastal brown bears, rule the roost looking for things along the shoreline, um, and then eating the salmon later in the summer. Um, there's sea lions, stellar sea lion. Um, there's wolves. It's a rare sighting. And I guess in my 20 years in Alaska, I've done Alaska in a while. I've seen wolves maybe five times, but they are there. This is called the wild being in Southeast Alaska. It's an archipelago, the, the Alexander Archipelago. So we're kind of talking from Ketchikan up to Juneau and then up into Glacier Bay. Um, here's the beloved and cute sea otter, which has made a big comeback. They were, of course, wiped out, or almost wiped out, extinct, you know, with, with the fur trade. This one with a little pup shot from a zodiac. And then the charismatic megafauna, the killer whales. Great opportunities for seeing killer whales, especially on our longer voyages up there. Um, and there's nothing like seeing killer whales from, from, from the level of the water. And then the, <laughs> the acrobatic whales, the humpbacks, which right now, and I do workshops down in Maui at this time of year, they are down there breeding, and then they swim to Alaska and rimming the Arctic higher latitudes to feed during the summer. And they do this thing called bubble net feeding where they come up all at once, mouths the gate. And so the same male whales that were competing and rough housing down in Hawaii, many of them will come up and cooperatively feed together on the herring and they'll come up and then, so you can see the, the baleen on the, on the upper roof of their mouths here. Uh, and what, and it's a rainbow coming out of the blowhole, we call it a rain blow. Um, the misty, I, I don't like 
I mean, a lot of photographers, we don't really like the sunny weather. We like to have clouds and weather. Um, we don't want pouring rain all the time, but having mist in Alaska is, is magical. And I would be remiss to talk about Southeast Alaska without showing one picture of a bald eagle. Because if you had a long lens up to about a 300, you can get, <coughs> excuse me, you can get very good pictures of bald eagles. Um, beautiful light in the mornings and in the evenings. It's the coastal range just outside of Petersburg, probably when we're waking up there. Um, and to go into uh, Tracy Arm Fjord, which has the bluest ice in the world, this beautiful fjord, um, calving the blue ice. Yes, the glaciers in Southeast are retreating and they're calving quite spectacularly. So we spend time in Zodiacs looking at the ice, which is one of my favorite things to do as well. Um, we're gonna end up going to a warm climate. Um, I wish we could go there right now. I have a, a workshop scheduled in late April, early May this year on our ship. And like everyone, we're all wondering, is that gonna happen? Um, it's just the world that we live in right now, one of uncertainty. So the Galapagos Islands, these volcanic islands offshore, they're offshore of Ecuador. Uh, does that landscape look volcanic? This is the most famous view, a panoramic view. I actually, you could make this with your iPhone, but I stitched photos together um, with my DSLR and, and made this panoramic. And that's actually the, it's a number of years old because that's actually the uh, original Endeavor in, in, the, in the photo. But we have our newer ship, um, the Endeavor 2, that is very comfortable. And along with the Islander, these two ships ply the waters of the Galapagos. Um, all of the 97, you probably know this, 97% of the Galapagos Islands are national park. So we go, we land at visitor sites using our Zodiacs. On our photo expeditions, we get up early and get out for the good light, but there's good light and good things to see any time of day in the Galapagos. Often there's great clouds. Um, we follow naturalists in groups. You do have to stay with groups and stay on the trail. You're not quite as free, except when you're on beaches in the Galapagos, and there's good reason for that. But if you follow someone like Socrates, you will be led to beautiful things like this land iguana. And if you hang out in the photo groups, you'll be taught about your cameras and you'll be, you know, help in the moment um, if you have an issue. Um, a lot of times though, you're just out on the beach. This is one of the best situations where you have the sea lions out on the beach on one of the islands and you can just spend time with the sea lions. Um, sometimes sea turtles, sea turtles will come ashore to nest and often we see them in the swash zone or, or, or coming and going. Again, it doesn't happen all trips. Um, so it depends on how dedicated you are. Did you guys catch that? She's there and then she gets swamped. She did not ruin her camera in this case, um, but they can be very docile and cute. And I keep telling myself, I'll never take another picture of a cute sea lion because I have so many, but I can't resist. And sometimes they come and check you out. So you've got to be ready. So that's a Hail Mary. She is probably shooting as the sea lion comes up to check out her lens. There are rules on how close you can get, but the wildlife, thankfully, they don't, they don't know the rules. Now, I mentioned tripods, and one of the great reasons to have a tripod is you can do this motion blur thing. So maybe a quarter of a second or an eighth of a second, or even down to one second exposures gives you this kind of soft look to the water, and you can play around with the Sally Lightfoot crabs. This guy was a superstar. I spent good 15 minutes photographing one crab. But this was the image that I was after because the water kept coming over him. and He would hunker down and then wouldn't move and he'd be still for just a fraction of a second. So I just needed about you know a quarter of a second, maybe, maybe just a little longer to get the water um, kind of soft like that. Um, the giant tortoises, sometimes we find them on the trails or in the highlands or when we're relaxing at <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm at the farm where we have lunch. Um, when we go to the highlands, there's a, there's a farm where they've raised the fences and the tortoises migrate through. So that's an excited couple there. And so you can spend time and they are they are docile. You have to use a really fast shutter speed to freeze the action with the tortoise. Just kidding. Um, but it, it's magical to be with them. Of course, the blue-footed booby. Everyone wants to see a blue-footed booby. 
Um, there's the blue-footed boobies, beautiful red feet, but who knew there's a red-footed booby? So on some of the trips, we go to Tower Island where there are red-footed boobies. One of the, the most unique, you know, the Galapagos is known for all the endemic species and you know about Darwin and his theories, you know, wondering about all the animals there. Um, and there's just something magical about it that they don't show fear of, of humans. It's not that they're tame, not even that they're used to humans. They just don't really care that you're there. Um, so you can spend time with them. This is a land iguana, but one of the coolest animals are these, <coughs> excuse me, the reptiles are the, the marine iguanas, the only marine iguana in the world because it goes and swims and then eats underwater. And when sometimes when you're snorkeling, we'll encounter these guys coming up and eating the algae. And if you're lucky while you're snorkeling, you might even get a Galapagos penguin. Who knew there are penguins at the equator? Actually, most penguins never see an iceberg. They mostly live above the, the, the Arctic waters. Um, but sometimes from a zodiac, we might get a nice portrait of these Galapagos penguins. And then there's the flightless cormorant. How would you like to be a bird? Well, penguins can't fly either, but these guys, the cormorants, they have cousins who can still fly, but they, these guys don't need to go anywhere. They're stranded offshore, so they just swim and eat fish that way. Um, one of the, the birds that everyone wants to see is the waved albatross that nests by the thousands on the islands. And walk, and they, they don't care where the trails are, so sometimes they're very close to the trail and you get beautiful close-up pictures. Or this shot we lucked out with, with the there was quite a swell breaking and there was all this spray bathing them in this beautiful blue light, excuse me, warm light as we were walking past. Um, I don't know why it took me so long. It took me a decade to get this shot. Now every trip we go, we, everyone gets a shot like this of, of um, oh, I'm spacing, spacing the bird right now. Um, but I know that's a pelican down below. <laughs> And it's it's one of the dark girls, but um, I'll think of it when I when the talk ends. Uh, and the same with this. I'm just spacing on the gold for a second. But these guys feed at night, and um, you get very close to them on the islands. Again, they don't know, and they give you a crazy look sometimes with a zoom lens. And then we do crazy things as well. We celebrate sunsets with wine glasses and cameras. And we get really excited as the sun goes down and we get, get really uh, another great day on another great expedition in the Galapagos. So I'll leave you with this, this quote by dear John Lennon. And this is exactly what's going on right now. And reality leaves a lot to the imagination. And I have been imagining myself in so many different places. And I hope we get to go there soon. Thank you, everyone. I think we can entertain questions or are we going to wait till after Lisa talks? I see her there. So I'm going to stop my share. I think I did that right. Did I do that right? Well, I was just going to say, I was just going to say, Ralph, um, one of the things, one of the things that's really cool uh, in the evenings is when we have our photo recaps or when we actually have our photo lectures, right? Um, and you get the chance to kind of talk about particularly in Galapagos, how to frame photos and get that perfect shot, not just take the normal, you know, the rule of thirds and all those great things that so many of our guests don't understand when they're using their new cameras. So perhaps if you can talk a little bit about what it's like when we give those, those lectures on board and how we're helping people to really understand how to get the best shots of their lives when they're in the field. Yeah, well, one of our great frustrations is trying to find time to give talks. <laughs> To prepare everyone on board, um, so we do we do kind of shoehorn those in. We do ha have done photo expeditions where we spend two days on shore and do all our talks and then go to the ship. Um, but what we like to do, and what most of us do, is take pictures during the day to have examples to show at night or in our talk the next day, um, and, and lead lead people through. So we start from the most basic, and then and then work work our way up. But a lot of the a lot of the teaching happens in the field, especially in Galapagos. It's so great because you're in groups, uh, and you stay in the groups, and you have an animal there, and people really can come up and talk. Or in our other destinations, out on the bow or in the zodiac, we can do a lot of teaching, teach teaching there. Um, but our recaps after dinner are are a great time, and and you get more interesting questions when people are drinking cocktails. 
<laughs> That's true. I know uh, one of the things I really loved about on the way down to Antarctica and using our time judici judiciously as we crossed the Drake was everyone being able to bring up their cameras and figure out, you know, how to set their white balance. Because when you're down in Antarctica, there's all that snow. So, you know, how do you set the right white balance? Those are things that I think are invaluable when you're heading somewhere like that. Yeah, so in that first introductory talk that we, we typically will do, we'll have a hands-on, we'll break up into groups. A lot of times it's based on, on people's, uh, uh, whether they think they're advanced or beginners, sometimes it's based on cameras, but the most popular talk of all is the talk about smartphones because everyone has one and, and to realize that you can make a blurry shot, like those blurry shots I showed of the water moving with an iPhone on live, um, is a game changer for a lot of folks. Yeah. So I did. I did see a question here about when you're heading to somewhere like Antarctica and it's really cold. How can you prepare your camera to deal with the cold? What can you do to you know make your battery maybe last longer? Yeah, it actually goes both ways. In in the tropics, if your camera's too warm and you bring it in, or it's in the air conditioning and you go outside, it will fog up. You'll get condensation. Um, in, in the Antarctic, it's not as much about going, taking it outside as it's bringing it in. But what most of us do is we don't keep our cameras in our cabins where it's really warm. And we'll let our bags equilibrate, as we say. We'll, we'll put them outside a little bit um, before we, we go ashore. And in the tropics, we will have a place designated that's outside your room where everyone just has their camera bags so they're not in the air conditioning. And that's how, that's how we deal with it there. That's yeah. Great. Yeah, and then it's a good idea, isn't it, if you've got separate batteries to keep them somewhere on you where, where they're kind of warm, correct? When you're in somewhere yeah. like that. Yeah, extra batteries. You always want to have the ones in the camera, spares, and then, and then ones back in your room, back in your room charging. Um, and that and that that brings up some of the other questions we've we've had is like, you know, how do you be prepared to go out? Like, what would my settings be just to walk out the door? And it's usually f eight at a thousandth of a second. I want to be ready for wildlife, or maybe two thousandth of a second, because wildlife happen. You know, you get the call for a whale or a bear, you got to get out there and and be ready. If it, if it's a call for a sunset, you're going to have time to to mess with your settings. So I usually have a a medium telephoto on F8, a thousand or two thousandth of a second, um, ready to shoot. Always on motor drive, always on autofocus. Usually follow autofocus for wildlife. Um, so I'm ready. And um, but of course I'll have two cameras and my other one will be my wide angle. So I'll, I cheat that way. <laughs> That's quite okay. Um, yeah, no, so I, I, I just really loved when we were um, down in Baja and you've got the gray whales there. So that, that was a really important thing. The first thing that our photo instructor down there told us was always have it on motor because when you're with those whales and you wanna get that great shot, you know, you may take 20 or 30, particularly with the young ones that are spy hopping, it's happening so quickly. So those are really good tips. So as you leave the ship, you're ready. And then have the iPhone on video. Video, really, I mean, if, if, if you were giving a slideshow to tell the story about your expedition at home, having those video sequences that you can just let everyone really get into the fact that here comes the whale, it takes some time, the sounds, and just let it breathe. You just wanna let, and, and the trick with video is, hold it still, of course, but shoot shorter sequences. Don't turn the video on and, and, and be like this, you know, cause you're never gonna really edit it. Shoot 15 to 30 second clips, and if nothing's happening, stop it and start again. So you're stopping and starting again all the time, shooting shorter shorter clips. Um, of course, if you're waiting for a breach, you're just gonna hold it there and wait, and then you'd have to trim it. But you can trim your videos right in, right in your, your, especially the iPhone is the only one I use, so that's what I know, but you can trim your video right there. Yeah. The uh, other really cool piece of equipment that I ran out and purchased when I got back from Antarctica was the little beanbag tripod to put on the side of the ship because that was brilliant at cutting down on vibration. Yeah, yeah, beam bands for vibration, you, you can get around some of that, but with, with higher, with faster shutter speeds. But the thing, this is what's holding my light, but having this little gorilla pod, here's a little tiny tripod and you can clamp this on rails to do like time-lapse going through the ice. That's That time-lapse I showed was probably a, a, actually a GoPro time-lapse. 
um, st stitched together, but your iPhone does again does it right 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 in the right in the device. That's what I need. Every time, every time I see you, Ralph, I have to run out and buy another piece of equipment. Yeah. Now I need to go get one of those. <laughs> The, the oh, other, <laughs> the other question I had um, in advance was, do I shoot on manual or aperture or shutter priority? Um, those shots I showed of motion blur, that's when I go to shutter priority. When I want um, a slower shutter speed, I want to lock that fifteenth of a second in, and that's when I'll use shutter priority. But usually now with the new, the new technology, I'm shooting in manual, but I have it on auto. ISO, and so I can set, I can choose my shutter speed, I can choose my f-stop, and it's the ISO that fluctuates, um, which is a different way of shooting than we used to do, um, where we would change the f-stop, f-stop, and then be at a fixed ISO, and, and on and on. So you can you can try that because it takes ISO out of the equation, and it doesn't matter if it's dark. As long as you open your lens up to say F4 or something, you're going to get a good shot because your ISO will go up. Um, so just get the shot. And if it's sharp, it won't matter what, what ISO it's at. Ralph, one other one that we saw come through, um, if, if, as you started down the path of becoming a professional photographer, was there a specific resource training or publication that you found beneficial as you worked to develop your skills more? Well, that's interesting. I, I'm self-taught. And so it goes back to film in the, in the late 1970s, <laughs> teaching myself with a four by five camera. Um, in this day and age, there's a lot of great books. There's so many tutorials. Um, so I think now it's about, you've got to learn the, it's really about technology. You've got to learn, learn the camera system, light and, and the settings and the openings and the shutter speed, how fast things happen. At least they kept that universal. Um, so that's still the same, but someone now, it, it, you've gotta be digital pretty much unless you're doing fine art and you've gotta shoot what you love and what you understand. And if, if you do that, the camera is just an extension and the camera is just a tool and it doesn't matter what brand you use. Of course, if you're gonna make super huge prints, you want you know more resolution um, but most people shoot to tell stories, to post online, to create content, they put in videos, then you have to have a drone. <laughs> uh, that is a question that comes up quite a bit for folks that want to travel on our ships is, do we allow drones? No. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drone. Yeah. Can you imagine if you had 12 guests all flying their drone? Um, uh -huh. They're they're a little intrusive when you're in a wilderness area. Now that said, um, we have a video chronicler on board who shoots basically makes a documentary of the trip. Um, that is that is a, is available and depending on the trip. There is a small service charge because of all the equipment, and he might have a drone. And so all the footage in those documentaries are from that trip. So there are times where we'll send the the videographer out in a zodiac away from the ship, and he'll shoot shoot these high high um, viewpoint shots, which really adds a lot to the trip. But we just can't, and it's a permitting process as well in most of the places we go. And it takes away from the experience, the noise. I mean, particularly Antarctica. The one of the beauties of Antarctica is the utter silence, and that you can hear wildlife from so far away and that ice breaking. And, and I can't imagine if you could hear engines and noise overhead, I think it would take away from the experience. Yeah, it's just not manageable and it's a permitting thing. I mean, some countries, boy, they just, they'll, they'll take your drone away just when you land at the airport. Um, so it's, and then now in, in the US, you actually need to have a remote pilot's license. And I'm not sure what they call it. Um, if your drone's of a, of a larger size. Uh, but but they're great, but they're great when you're out and you're not around anyone. Yeah. Do you have any more questions, Angela, or will I have a do a quick overview of the ship? Oh, yes. Let's do that, please. I can do that. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> That's okay. I did, I did just want to share a few slides of our new ship. Now, Ralph mentioned the National Geographic Endurance when he first started. And this is our brand new vessel. She launched just in time for all of this shenanigans and the great pause to start. 
Um, and her sister will join us in October of this year, and that's the National Geographic Resolution. So these are real game changers uh, as far as expedition travel is concerned. They're built for 126 guests. So 126 guests, so that's only 69 cabins. And of those 69 cabins, 53 of those will be balcony suites. And all of our solo guests will be in balcony suites. Um, she has that pointy nose and that's a really cool new technology. It's called an X-Bow. And the X-Bow is designed to, instead of riding up and down over a wave, she cuts at the base of the wave. And so instead of this movement in rough weather, you have a much smoother, calmer, approach to rough weather adverse conditions. So for somewhere like the Drake Passage or up in the Arctic, this is a beautiful platform to be able to explore upon. She's also an ice class PC-5. Uh, what does that mean? It just means she can live in the ice year round. So these ships will be from pole to pole, Arctic and Antarctica. Um, and a PC-5 is actually stronger than a PC-6. So the lower the number, the stronger the vessel. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, one of the really key things with our ships is the way they're designed for, for when Ralph and the team are speaking to our guests. And that's always done in our lounge. And we have this great circular uh, area in the middle, which we call our circle of truth. That's where they go. That's where they present from. That's really important because we're not lecturing at you. We're sharing knowledge. And when you're in the round, it's much more conducive to back and forth conversation and guest to guest conversation. Because what we're trying to do is build a community, a community of like-minded travelers. And so this layout is just a perfect way to be able to share that knowledge. The other really cool thing you'll notice from this ship is all the glass. Every room on this ship is glass. The whole idea when we're there is what's outside is the most important thing. It's the luxury of access. It's where we're going that's important. And so these two ships have, well, all of our ships do, but these two ships in particular, every room is glass. The di main dining room, all guests have a window seat. The kitchen is actually in the center. There's an open uh, kitchen area where you can see the chef and the team preparing all that great sustainable cuisine but every guest sits at a window seat. And there are two different dining options on the vessel. You've got a wet and dry sauna, you've got a yoga studio, you've got a fitness center, you've got a spa. You have two infinity hot tubs on the back deck. And then you have these really super cool glass igloos that hang out over the side of the ship. Um, and those have day beds in them. So imagine if you're up in the Arctic in September when we hope to see those northern lights, being able to sit out there in the evening in this warm glass igloo and see this, these amazing lights. It, it is pretty cool. Or, um, you know, Ralph was talking about South Georgia and the Falklands, and we do have a standalone South Georgia and the Falklands expedition, if you're interested in that one. Ralph mentioned it. Um, to be able to be able to sit out there and just get ready to duck out and take a photo when you're ready. Um, the ship itself has a library, a brilliant science hub. That's where we can get the microscopes out and look at what's happening in the marine biodiversity around the ship. And there's a 270 degree wrap around screen. So we can pull all of that data and knowledge up in front of us as we're up in the science hub. There's a chef's table up there. There's a, a fantastic area to, to do research with our team. And then you've got your open bridge. And the really cool thing about all of our ships is we have an open bridge policy. We want you to go up and meet with the captain and the team. Often this is where you'll find people like Ralph or our expedition team looking for wildlife. It's a great kind of viewpoint. Um, and also you get to talk to these amazing men and women who are traveling all over the seas and the oceans of the planet but this bridge is big enough to fit all 126 guests at the same time. There's seating areas, there's a fantastic coffee machine. You can go up there early in the morning, make a coffee. It's just a great way to better understand what you're seeing. The other really cool thing are the rooms. These are gorgeous. These are our top level suites. They've got hammocks outside on the deck, tables and chairs. You've got a walk-in wardrobe, a beautiful big bathtub, rain showers, just gorgeous, gorgeous state rooms. So as I said, 69 cabins, 53 with balconies, the rest with big picture windows. But this is all about a ship that is specifically designed to access these wild places, a really cool um, Zodiac deployment system, either from the back of the ship or the side of the vessel. Um, and so there's just, 
it's just going to be wonderful when we can actually be out exploring aboard both of them. So if you think Antarctica and the Arctic, Russian Arctic, we're going back to the Northwest Passage in 2022. We have stunning, itiner stunning itineraries down through Japan in 22 on the resolution, across from South Pacific and into Easter Island, down through Patagonia. So lots and lots of great opportunities on these two vessels. Um, the really cool trip, the two really cool trips are the epic Antarctica from Ushuaia down along the peninsula all the way along the west coast of Antarctica into the Ross Sea and then up through the sub-Antarctic islands to New Zealand or the northeast passage that goes from Tromso in Norway all the way across the top of Russia. So think polar bear and narwhal and walrus. It's just amazing wildlife all the way through the top there and into Nome, Alaska. So some really cool longer trips in the ice that these ships allow us to do. So saying that, um, Angela, if we've got any other questions, love to take the, take them. Thanks, Lisa. We do have a couple more. Um, we obviously have quite a few people who have done some spectacular travel with Limblad Expeditions, um, and COVID has gotten in the way of a couple of those. One gentleman asks um, if you might have any thoughts on what's going to happen with the South Georgia in 2022. That's his hopeful for the next trip with you all. South Georgia and the Falklands? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I can do some research and find out what the dates will be. Actually, I wish I had my reservations up. I could give you the dates straight away. Um, but we have every intention of the Antarctica season at the end of this year running. So, um, yeah, I will I will get with you, Angela, and get you the dates and the availability. Okay. And then the other two that, that just came up from another gentleman are um, maybe a little bit more details about the Northwest Passage in July and... He asks more about- Yeah, them. July 2022. Yeah, that's a brilliant new itinerary. So that is that is on the new resolution. So that is the ship that will launch later this year. So that's going to take you all the way from Kangalooswak over the top of Canada. Um, and so that's just been launched. I've, um, and I think you've been up there, haven't you, Ralph? Were you up there on one of our last trips up into the Northwest Passage? Yeah, we got iced out that year, but uh, it, it, it's spectacular because you have to pick your way through and you know, go around the top of Baffin Island and past Devon Island. And, you know, you're basically in the wake of the Franklin Expedition. And I think, and yeah, heading. and I think that was the year Sven had to fly up, right? Because, and this is the beauty of the new ship. She won't need an icebreaker to help her get through, so. Yeah, we, yeah, it was uh, still one of the best trips ever. Um, any anyone any trip that goes up into that part of the world is just, just spectacular. Hey, while I'm thinking about it, um, I, I mean, I did have to look in the, in my notes, but the brown naughty was sitting on top of the the pelican, <laughs> swallowtail gull that's out on Tower Island, the one that that fishes at night and has that beautiful red eye ring. So, red eye, aren't they pretty? Oh my God, just I didn't have the birds uh, at the tip of my tongue there. Thank you. <laughs> So the Northwest Passage also, Angela, just it's it's got a bit more of a cultural component than the Northeast Passage because you do have those small villages along the top of Canada. So there's opportunities not just for wildlife, but for cultural interactions as well on that particular itinerary. We do I'll love that a lot too. Passage. Northeast um, Passage this summer, hopefully, and that epic Antarctica um, early 2022. Um, and Lisa, I, I apologize. George was saying he's... Um, scheduled already for Antarctica, Costa Rica, and the Galapagos, and was just kind of wondering if we have an idea of when the trips will be restarting, which, you know, we all wish we had that, that crystal ball, but. Yeah, I was about to say, let me reach for my crystal ball. <laughs> uh, I so wish I'd had it, because then I would have known to buy Zoom shares back at the beginning of this whole debacle. <laughs> exactly. um, I, I've look. Got, I've got Dr. Fauci on the line, <laughs> and he's <laughs> get vaccinated. Okay. <laughs> So look, I, our plan, we're, we're aiming for April, May to start back out, right? So that's our goal. Um, you know, there's there's little changes keep getting thrown at us all the time as as we all see Canada closed down. Then, you know, we have the CD say we, see, we, say we need um, shots before we, or tests before we come back in. So we're working all the way through that. I know you and I have spoken. We're hopeful to have a lot more information next week to two weeks as we work through all of these new protocols. 
but um, it's something that we're working extremely hard because trust me, it's not good to have people like Ralph at home too long. <laughs> <laughs> and Ralph, we did have one last question for you um, on the photography side of things and wondering how much do you use a monopod? How, how often do I use a monopod? Um, that's that's a good question because I've kind of shifted the way I work since I have Olympus cameras and they're lighter and they have really good um, image stabilization and you can handhold a lot. But um, on the bow of the ship, let's say you're going to the Arctic or the Antarctic and you want to shoot with longer lenses, having a monopod is very advantageous, whether you're shooting whales or polar bears, because it makes you more more patient. It's not that you need it to hold the camera, but how long can you stand like this, holding your camera, waiting for something to happen? And you wanna be ready for when it's happening because as soon as you drop it, that whale will breach. Yeah. Um, so that's why, and, it's, and they pack easily, they slip right into your duffel. So um, at least a monopod, if, if you're at all, you know, at that level of being serious about your photography with longer lenses. And Lisa, I apologize. I, there's some coming in the question and answers and some in the chat, and I did miss one, um, but I think it's a really fun one. I personally am very excited about this particular destination. Do the Galapagos Island ships cover all of the islands? So, no, you don't cover all of the islands. What we've done, because of our time in Galapagos since 1967 and our relationship with the islands, we've been able to create two itineraries. So one that kind of takes more to the north and one more to the south. However, both itineraries give such a great cross section of the different endemic wildlife. So you're really not losing out by doing either of those um, because they're designed so that you really get the best experience for the wildlife component. And really that's what it's about. It's those endemic species. Um, that question's usually very quickly followed up by what's the best month to go. Um, there isn't a bad month. This is a place where wildlife is breeding at all times of the year, just different ones. So if there's a specific bird, like a blue footed booby you wanna see on the nest with their young, then talk to us because we'll get you the, the right frame of time to be there to, to go to North Seymour Island, or maybe it's the frigates, right? So um, we can certainly help get you there at the best time with the greatest opportunity. Um, but yeah, look, there, there, there isn't a bad time. And the way we've set up our two itineraries, there isn't a bad itinerary because you're seeing such a good cross section of wildlife. And we're very fortunate that a bulk of the team here at Wallace Pearson Travel have been to the Galapagos and can also really help figure out the best experiences based on, on your interests and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, uh, you know, as, as Ralph said, a good little underwater camera, particularly in the Galapagos, is so important. You are going to be out there snorkeling at least once a day. Um, and to have a good little camera that you can grab some quick shots and it doesn't need to be expensive. Um, I, you know, Ralph, I know you, you can have, get a good cross section of, of underwater cameras, but you know, when I took my kids, we had a little Fuji underwater camera and it got great shots, um, you know, because yeah, it's, we're not professionals. We just wanted something to show people we actually could get a penguin, well, a tail or a flipper. We actually never got a whole penguin. Um, they're pretty quick, but uh, yeah, no, look, it's, it's an amazing place. Yeah, you can you can I mean you can get a housing for your for your iPhone and and to get a a good one where you can really control what's going on, you know, it's a few hundred dollars. Um, a lot of people go with the GoPro. Again, it's a few hundred dollars, but they're harder to use hmm. um, to learn that menu system. Um, the the number one camera we recommend is the TG. I think they're up to six. It's an Olympus camera, very easy to use, and it it does great, great underwater and, and for topside too. So that's kind of like, that's the, the second camera that a lot of people will, will carry around. There's one question I want to get, because there was on my pre-advanced sheet, I'm packing my bag for a trip. Do I prefer zoom lenses or prime lenses? Prime being a fixed focal length. And I try to go with zooms mostly. I mean, that's kind of the way it's gone since the technology has gotten so good and zooms are very sharp and and then you have one lens on and, and a lot of times with the Olympus, I'll use the 12 to 20, 12 to 200, um, no 12 to 100, which is like a 24 to 200 on most cameras. Um, 
and then uh, but but prime lenses if you're a ser serious photographer you want to carry one um you know something in the 300 millimeter range can work but you're always going to feel like you want to zoom because in the zodiacs you can't really move around and and getting off trail in some places so it's better that this in this day and age it's better to go with the zoom rather than lugging around a big big prime lens you'll be much happier I will say one of the things I've learned from our photographers over the years that that is really important. Don't buy a new camera and then bring it straight to the ship. Get it out of the box. <laughs> That's the look you'll get right there. What Ralph just did. Um, take it out of the box and play with it for several weeks before you travel. Right. Because there's nothing worse than being there and you want that shot of that great penguin and you, you never get it because you're still trying to figure out, well, what do I, how do I turn it on? How do I turn it off? So just play with it, you know, do all the different settings. Watch Ralph and the team have done some great little tutorials um, during the COVID pause that you can, you know, get from the team at Wallace Pearson and you can kind of watch those and go out and practice. But do practice because otherwise you'll get to the ship and not only will they laugh and smile at you in a very friendly way, <laughs> and I look at you very knowingly, but you won't get the shots you want. So if that's the one thing I can tell you from everyone I've spoken to, practice on a new camera before you take it. I'll give you your $25 after that. Uh, but the, the other thing is once you book with us, you'll get a, a link to a webinar where I run through, you'll see some of the same slides actually, where I run through you know, preparation and, and recommendation for cameras. But uh, now that you've watched this webinar, you're, you're, you can write me anytime. Um, with emails, go through proper channels, I guess, and they'll get to me. And um, we're happy to help. Once, once your book, we're all yours. Yes, and definitely if there are any questions that somehow we didn't get around to, um, the team will be more than happy to make sure that Lisa and Ralph are, um, are, are asked these beautiful questions and we'll get the answers right back to you as soon as possible. All right. Yep. Well, I think that slowed things down a little bit. And um, I want to thank all of you so much for your time. And Ralph and Lisa, I mean, such amazing energy and information and just such special experiences. And let's go. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> hey, get vaccinated. <laughs> thank you. We're so eager to go. We just yeah, let's let's go. That's okay. Well, thank you. We we love working with Wallace. Thank you. you guys are such a huge supporter of ours, and you know our product as nearly as well as we do. So, um, but you know where to find us. So, if there are any other questions that pop up, please send them into the team, and we'll be happy to get back with some answers for you. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Pleasure. Thank Thanks, Angie. Have a Thank great you. evening. See you, Dan. See you, Debbie. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.